Good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Ashidi. Welcome to the Atheist for Liberty YouTube channel. Hope you're all having a wonderful holiday season. We're getting close to the end of the year. Already Christmas is around the corner for those who celebrate, and we have a lot to unpack. We've done a lot already in 2021 here at AFL. We started the streaming series just a few months ago with Michael Shermer, continued on with David Silverman and James Lindsay. We have another great guest here for you all tonight. Um, I am very proud to say as well that we built a very nice audience here. Already looking back at the YouTube channel, as of today, we have more than 6,500 views for the James Lindsay stream. And we think that the audience that we've captured here, all of you loyal and dedicated to us, wanting to see us produce more content, we really do appreciate it here within the AFL staff and volunteer teams. Um, so going into early 2022, we're continuing our conference exhibitions. We're going to be producing more content for all of you. We're coming out with a lot more stuff that's going to make the YouTube channel more interactive. Already having a bit of a break in between uh, the James Lindsay stream and this stream now, we've been having quite a bit of meetings to ensure that all your membership benefits uh, continue to be fulfilled. And we're going to be working day in and day out to make sure that Atheist for Liberty's growth um, happens more and more thanks to you and your ideas. So. Without further ado, let's get on to introducing the speaker and going forward from there. So Melissa Chen is the contributing editor for The Spectator, the oldest English language magazine in publication. She's a senior fellow at the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, also known as FAIR, and a board member at Ideas Beyond Borders, which makes inaccessible ideas freely accessible to those who speak Arabic, Farsi, and Kurdish. She serves as editor at Global Conversations. Her past appearances have included the Joe Rogan Experience, the Oslo Freedom Forum, the Rubin Report, Fox Nation, Trigonometry, Myth Informed, and more. She studied computational biology at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and at Boston University and worked at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Melissa Chen, welcome to the Atheist for Liberty channel. Hi. Hi, Thomas. Thank you guys for having me. I know we wanted to get you on as well for a while. It was it was a competition between you and James. We we spoke a little bit at Better Discourse three in early November, and uh, I know that you're very busy. You're engaging in, in so much work. I think well, in, so is James alone. We're we're barely going to scratch the surface at all the great things that you've been doing. But uh, I'm really happy to have you on, and uh, we really appreciate all you do and to support us in our mission as well. Well, I'm really happy that, in a way, there is a part of organized atheism that can continue. Otherwise, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't even be involved in, in anything, just yes. given as how the landscape has changed, honestly, in the last, I don't know, six years. Very so much thank so. thank you guys. Yeah. I will thank, well, and thank you for supporting us. So actually going into that topic in and of itself, um, you know, we are atheists for liberty. And I know that with the work that you do, you, you talk about issues from critical race theory to, to wokeism amok to foreign policy. Um, but we're going to go yeah. back in time a little bit for you, talking about an issue that, that you got heavily involved in uh, several years ago, atheism. Um, and I, I'd like to just uh, have you give a brief overview as to, you know, what your childhood was like, what your religious background and how you later became uh, a fellow godless even, a fellow atheist. <laughs> um, well, actually, before I get into that, I will say that, you know, there was kind of a golden age of, of atheism that coincided with what the press mainstream media was calling new atheism. It was the rise of Richard Dawkins and, and popular books like The God Delusion, um, Christopher Hitchens, The Four Horsemen, right? And they all started writing these books debunking religion. So that was kind of the, the golden age of, of new atheism. And, and that's when I started getting involved. Um, but, but, you know, kind of Going all the way back, how I became an atheist, um, you know, I, I tend to think we're all born atheists. <laughs> so it's it's mm. what you were indoctrinated with, and 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 you know, it's it's so much of what religion you adopt is based on, you know, where you were born, who your parents were, all these other factors. It's 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 not really a coincidence in in, in that way. Um, it's it's quite deterministic. I mean, very few people, you know, end up searching independently and then find something else, like maybe disaffected, you know, people who like, you know, white liberals who eventually find Buddhism because they went on a deliberate search to eat, pray, love journey in India. 
Um, but in, in my case, you know, just like everybody else, I was born into the religion. My, my parents are Protestants. My mom was Methodist. So I was baptized Methodist uh, at a very young age and, um, and, and went to Christian schools my whole life, Sunday schools and Sunday, that kind of typical, you know, uh, uh, church kind of upbringing. My mom was also very involved in church in the sense that she was embroiled in all the church politics. So I got to see the social side of religion as well. Um, and naturally, I, I, I was just always skeptical. I was always the kid that caused problems in Sunday school. Teachers would, you know, call my parents and say, can you please stop her from asking questions? Um, e I mean, even I'm poking holes in the story of Genesis all the time. And I was just kind of a nuisance in that way. Uh, you were probably a little well, confused, too, while you were in Catholic school because you were raised as a Methodist. So you went to a Methodist church right. on the weekends. Right. And then, yes. you know, during the week you'd go, you'd go. To I went to Catholic a convent. School. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and there are there are conflicting beliefs there. Like, for example, the Catholics believed in purgatory. The the, the Christians, the, the Protestants didn't. And so I'm like, wait, but, you know, they said that there was this stage before you go to heaven that you have. But and then at, on Sundays at church. They'll be like, no, that doesn't exist. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even the, the depictions of Jesus Christ, whether it's crucifix or, or no, no crucifix uh, is, is totally different. But um, I was always kind of uh, predisposed to first principles thinking and asking why, why, why till I get to the root cause. And so that right. that is kind of a problem for for religions, because there are some questions that they just can't answer. Mm -hmm. And um so in, in a way, like asking like how, how I became an atheist, I think I was always skeptical, even though it was shoved down my throat. Um, my social orbits were all, you know, everyone was religious around me, schools, families. So, so it was hard not to, it was hard to escape it in that sense. But, but around the age of 16, 17, I, I, I read the book, The Selfish Gene. And that was so satisfying because I went to Christian schools. I didn't, I wasn't taught evolution. So I wasn't mm -hmm. exposed to the ideas of evolutionary biology. I didn't know who Charles Darwin was. And I took biology all the way till, you know, like high school. Right. Um, but because they were Christian schools, that kind of, uh, you know, all that knowledge was just not available to me. But a friend actually bought a book for me. He gave me a book and the book was The Selfish Gene. And I read it from cover to cover. And by the time I, I turned the last page of that book, I was very comfortable because I had understood now how it, this theory, this entire framework of evolution could explain all of life. And it was so, mm. so satisfying because I, I didn't understand it before. Like it just wasn't taught. So that was when the moment I was actually comfortable calling myself an atheist. Although of course, mm. philosophically, if you, if you kind of like drill me, you know, like pin me on this question, I think even the most hardcore militant atheists like Richard Dawkins would say, we can't, you know, it, it, like he will say like on the scale of one to one to seven, he's probably like a six. We're all technically yeah. agnostics, right? Right. Because um, you, you it, this is something you cannot prove. Like it, it's, it's not some, it's not a hypothesis that can actually be proven. You can't prove an absolute. So, exactly. So, um that's how I became an atheist. And, and mm -hmm. that journey of questioning of like, oh my gosh, you know, once you question one thing, a lot of other things start opening up, right? Like mm -hmm. you start like, oh my gosh, well, what else did I think was, was false? And to have your entire world kind of turned upside down is a very disorienting feeling, but mm -hmm. it's liberating and disorienting at the same time. And that also coincided with when I started going to college in America and, you know, immigrated over. So all of that was super new and, and I was following all the books. And once I read one book, I started reading more and more. I read Sam Harris. I read, you know, Christopher Hitchens. I started following even the arguments for free will, the debates between Dan Dennett, um, and and, and uh, Sam Harris, people like that. So it, it was all, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of a very basic bitch introduction to atheism in a way, because mm -hmm. I did come in through the four horsemen. Right. And, um, and, and, and then when I got to the United States, you know, at the time, this was like during the, the kind of the, the height of Iraq war, you know, Bush, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the sort of like moral majority kind of consensus was still at play yes um, very, much so. very much so so you know it, the censorious behavior was coming more from the right than the left and so things were very different when i first came to mm -hmm. the u.s this was around 2004 um 
And so, I mean, I, I started getting involved in, I first started going uh, to atheist conferences, which used to mm -hmm. be a thing. They're not a thing now. It's almost like a relic of the past, like Blockbuster. Um, but atheist conference used to be, uh, you know, pop up in different cities. There were actually different groups. You had the American Humanist Association. You had um, things like the more fun side of it, like Apostacon that was Pastafarians. And, you know, there was there was I a remember. lot of vari variety. And then the, you had the skeptic mm -hmm. community, too. So the magicians like uh, James Randi had his the amazing you know meeting that was more focused on skepticism but but that's such a huge alignment also with atheism mm -hmm. but you had all this is was a very fertile ground a lot of things to choose from and and you know you have people like Neil deGrasse Tyson science communicators coming to speak we i remember one time we had Dr. Carolyn Porco who ran the the Cassini mission on uh, the, to the, pro the sent the probes out to Saturn like astronomers would come mm -hmm. and, and talk you know so it was it used to be cool <laughs> And and then obviously things started unraveling and, and the landscape has changed to the point that like now really Atheist for Liberty is the only uh, actual group that you should be involved with. Sadly. And I don't even like that. Saying that as president, I, I've said quite a few times that I don't even like the fact that we exist. We exist for a reason. We need to exist. Um, but I think, right. I think actually it's a great way. The way you ended it is a great way to go into the second question. We've had a few different guests on. We had um, Michael. We started off the streaming series with having Michael Shermer on. Then we had David Silverman, and then we had James Lindsay. And and for each of them, we talked about the rift within the atheist movement and the eventual collapse and death of the atheist movement due to wokeness. But each of them came from a different perspective. You had Shermer coming at it from a from a you know big top line new atheist intellectual perspective. You had David Silverman coming at it from the activist perspective. James Lindsay was kind of late to the show, so he was just kind of seeing this from from somebody who was just barely getting in the door as it is. But one thing I remember is that you have made a few tweets and a few comments on your social media about, about a very interesting phenomenon, about how some people within the atheist community had a decent amount of mental health problems. And within these conferences, within these events, these, these big atheist gatherings, um, which I think contributed very heavily to, to you know the wokeness spreading, were people's own individual mental health issues that they did not um, they did not take care of. Instead, they inflicted their own biological problems and own mental problems onto conference attendees, onto organizations, onto boards of directors, onto attacking other YouTubers viciously um, for no apparent reason whatsoever other than disagreeing with their ideology, but, but in a way that seems so out of touch to a normal person. Um, and we talked a little bit behind the show, uh, before the show about how you, you, you kind of have a prediction as to why you think that that happens to be the case. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a bit of self-selection going on. If you think of the kind of the, the psychological profile of a person that, that is so disagreeable that they're willing to, to leave their social circles, because when you leave religion, you're sometimes leave you're, you're you're leaving your entire social support behind whether it's your family yeah. or your friends or i mean this is very common in, in religions like mormonism islam um and so it takes a person to just say you know what all that is bull but not just all that is bull mm -hmm. but i'm actually going to leave because you're to to leave a social support system behind mm -hmm. is a very bold move and and it takes a certain you know disagreeable person to do something like that. So I think there's some sort of self-selection going on. You know, activist types have a certain um, kind of mental profile. So to begin with, I was telling Thomas before the show, there are, you know, Pew Research actually found, for example, which which take, take this how you will, 62% of white people who um, classify themselves as very liberal or liberal have been told by a doctor that they have a mental health condition. This is in contrast to 26% of conservatives and 20% of moderates, right? So, so you have this imbalance already. People who identify as liberals are about three times as likely to have mental health issues. Um, of course, you can debate about you know, why that is. 
probably there is a self-reporting issue. Maybe it is true that conservatives are less likely to see the doctor admit that they have a problem to begin with so mm-hmm. they don't get diagnosed versus, you know, people identify as liberals tend to go more to the doctors and, and, and are more comfortable talking about mental health. So they get diagnosed at higher mm-hmm. rates. That, that's possible. Um, but, but this result has bared out for quite a while. And, I, you know, I've seen research going all the way back to 2007 and, and the same pattern, um, you know, is, is in place. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think most atheists tend to be liberal. And so you yeah. have this self-selection effect, right? I mean, because most conservatives are religious and so they're conservatives. And um, so you have the mm-hmm. self-selection effect where I think more people have mental health issues. And now you couple that with the fact that they are divorced from their social network. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. they get thrust into this new social struggle. So, so you yeah. know, a big part of it is that these groups, these atheist groups that they start joining, becomes their social support, and worse, it becomes their identity, their new identity. Yeah. And because they have this identity crisis, right? And so you couple all these, all these um, kind of like these are rec- this, It's like a recipe for for some sort of like personality, you know, like, like just issues. Mm-hmm. And, right. and what we've seen, I, I've witnessed at, at Atheist Conference, actually kind of histrionic behavior, like, I won't very much who. so. I, 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 stating this from my own bias, and also my own personal experience, I started in politics going to American Atheist Conventions, going to so many Secular Student Alliance Conventions. There was a time, one of my first conventions ever was the Secular Student Alliance Convention in 2016. And I remember hanging out in a dorm room lobby with with all the different attendees. And there were two different mental health breakdowns going down at the same time. This one poor woman freaking out and rushing to an elevator because someone talked about the mere existence of firearms. And, and this person screamed to the top of her lungs, went to an elevator. And I saw this happen at numerous other atheist um, atheist conventions. Granted, that example was a very extreme one, but similar behaviors happened at nearly every other national atheist event that I could think of. And, you know, we, we let these people take over the movement. Compare that to the conservative conferences that I've gone to over the past few years, CPAC, uh, the Turning Point Student Action Summit, uh, you know, Turning Point USA just had America Fest happening a few days ago. You go to the, those events, and it's not like there aren't people there that have their own mental health issues and, and ex- extremists on the other end of the political spectrum. But you usually tend to see people that that you, as a heterodox person, would classify behavior-wise as, not to sound mean, more as more normal more normal behaving, somebody that you can have a conversation with, someone that you can have a dialogue with, someone who you're not questioning just by looking at them directly for the first few seconds. Is this person nuts? Is this person crazy? Um, uh, am I gonna? Am I going to get noted on a blog somewhere after just you know uh, disagreeing with them just slightly on one little tiny issue? Um, but but it yeah. was quite visible. It was quite visible at comparing the atheist scene from other different countercultures, and. And it's strange to me, actually. You're you're right because you know we because of this huge overlap in atheism and science, you would expect the atheist to be the one to come up with something like facts don't care about your feelings, right? Right. Because we're the ones that embrace science. Why did it take Ben Shapiro to come up with it? Um, And and it it became like his call sign. This is very strange to me. And one of the things that you just pointed out, I think the word I would use is stoicism. Mm -hmm. There is a sense of stoicism that conservatives tend to, to have like you separate your emotions from you know from from your your behavior um you you don't kind of like internalize everything and then mm-hmm. and then you kind of see this the what what happens to activists like i'll never forget what happened at yale where where the students were surrounding professor nicholas uh, christakis yes. and they were shouting and screaming you make us feel unsafe why because he sent an email saying that you know Halloween costumes are not racist. We should all, you know, just partake in the holiday and, and have fun. That was the mm. gist of his email. And and the histrionics that that invoked was, I don't know where that came from. And that's the kind of uh, behavior that you witnessed and I witnessed um, at Atheist Conference with activist types screaming. I mean, we, so Thomas and I have gone to uh, conferences like the, you know, Mythicist Milwaukee's Myth Informed Conference. We've had sort of uh, activist types who weren't even there calling in, reporting bomb threats, you know, getting sponsors to pull out. I mean, they're very motivated to, to cancel and, and they're not even there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was crazy. I remember being at a uh, Mines IRL, uh, the after party in 2019. Antifa was protesting us across the street in a small town, Pittman, New Jersey. And we were not even allowed to leave the building because the organizers feared for our safety. We had cops guarding the back door for us. Um, Andy No was inside with us. So that was another um, that was <laughs> another asset that greatly needed to be um, protected. Uh, too. Well, the worst part about that conference is that those people, right, actually mm -hmm. called Daryl Davis, who was inside the bar with us, a white supremacist. Yeah. Because Daryl Davis, a black man who has de-radicalized more KKK members than anyone else, he has actually obtained 200 hoods after these people left the Klan because mm -hmm. of his engagement with them. What have these people ever done for fascism, right? They're like bash to fash. Well, Daryl has done more than anyone. Mm -hmm. And and here they are bashing him outside of the bar, calling him a white supremacist. I mean, I how how morally depraved do you have to be that you're calling Daryl Davis? And so one thing I found out was that the, the organizers actually offered to go over and invite the Antifa members who are protesting into the bar to have a conversation. I mean, if Daryl mm -hmm. Davis can converse with the grand like like the Grand Duke a wizard or whatever of the KKK movement, he can certainly have a conversation with Antifa. Guess what? Right. They didn't want to do it. They actually declined. Because daring to talk to the enemy itself is is treason and enabling of fascism in their mind. Um, exactly. You know, and daring to, of course, um, confront the idea of problems in the atheist community and the problems of wokeism in that community and attacking speakers and people who built your movement up. You dare to have a, a solid conversation with them, then you're validating their points. We can't do that. Might as exactly. well just take over the movement and kill it instead in the name of secular humanism, above all else. <laughs> I know. Um, and and that is actually what did happen to to the atheist movement. There, there really are no more um, organized conferences almost yeah. at all. I can't think of one that's still going on. Maybe the America's Humanist Association, which just revoked a, you know, a prize to Richard Dawkins, right? Recently. Yeah. The 96 Humanist yeah. of the Year Award. And they gave it to Fauci. Correct. Um, <laughs> that joke. I didn't know that part. Okay, wow. They they gave the 2021. They took it away from Dawkins, and they gave the newest 2021 award to Fauci. Um, for, so that's for, how you for, know it's like any politics at its best. <laughs> I mean, it, supposedly it was for some transphobic statement he made, but but mm -hmm. it was again just like the J.K. Rowling issue, not transphobic at all. And and this man could not be somebody who's you know, more committed to to the principles of science than anyone. So it's surprising to me that these things are, are happening. And, you know, I mean, in a way, we did see it first in the atheist movement. I, I think we were early on the woke issue, many of us, including some of the people that you've spoken to in, on this uh, in this series. Mm -hmm. We recognized what was happening a lot earlier. We were kind of talking about woke. I remember a time when this was maybe 2015, 2016, when I started seeing the atheist movement and I was already tweeting about it or, or writing about it on Facebook. I was being told at the time, oh, don't worry. This is just confined to the fringe. Like, right. You know, what you're dealing with is just going to be re going to remain in your activist circles and in your intellectual circles and in, in academia. That's where I'll be. Don't worry. It's just They'll the grow feminist up. on YouTube versus the MRAs. You know, all the normal people are in the middle, and that's where the real conferences are at. Don't worry about that. It's just right. it's just exactly on both ends. Uh, I that's heard that what so we were told. Times. Yeah, yeah, that's what we exactly. were told. And by the way, everybody, um, for those of you who are watching and really liking the content here, really liking the discussion, and you like what we're doing, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like the video, and hit the notification bell to see more content. It really is awesome. Uh, it's really awesome for all of you to do that. The YouTube algorithm has been graciously uh, rewarding us for this. We got a great amount of views last stream. I think we're going to get overall a great amount of, of, of views overall after the stream concludes. And uh, we really appreciate all of your support. And if you want to see more content, again, hit the subscribe button, like the video, hit the notification bell. We're also going to be um, advertising more of our social media later on in the stream. So you mentioned stoicism. You mentioned how um, Usually the Ben Shapiro's, they, they usually tend to separate, especially the conservatives, they tend to separate emotions more from their arguments. And um, what was it? Angel wanted me to bring this up. We, we were talking about what questions to ask you. I've noticed that among the anti-woke people within atheism, even people who, who might have originally started out as liberal, started out uh, as, as, as more on the left of the, the spectrum, 
um, even if they have problems in and of it themselves, they tend to be more responsible. In my opinion, they tend to be people that usually take care of their their own health and their own issues more than the other side. Um, one thing I want to make very clear to everybody who's watching to, to just conclude this question is if you have a mental health problem, that's not something that, that I don't think people should mock you for at all. Um, we we should take mental health seriously and we should be compassionate to people who have who have these issues. But simultaneously, we should encourage personal responsibility to, to get yourself taken care of. And we didn't do that in the atheist community, the community of science, the community of reason, right? Um, and it was, it was, in my opinion, a golden ticket to theocrats and a golden ticket to our extreme opponents. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think Benjamin Boyce, if I pronounce his name correctly, actually did a great podcast episode on woke psycho psychopathy. He interviewed a psychologist about what he was calling these cluster B personality disorders and how they are almost inflamed um, in, in modern age because of, you know, the way discourse happens online. Um, social media encourages a lot of narcissism. And, and at the mm -hmm. end of the day, a lot of a lot of or atheism um, was actually I think atheism kind of blossomed because of social media, too, because people were very isolated in their communities. And until they found each other, they realized, oh my gosh, it's okay to think this. There's no, there's a whole bunch of other people like me. And so the other self-selection um, was, was also that atheists tended to be very online and very online people also tend to be mm -hmm. the kind of people that are going to be more drawn to, um, you know, these like narcissistic kind of social media channels that are posting about themselves and interest. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's also, um, you know, a very big factor. Uh, and, and this relationship is, is, is being explored more and more. I've noticed, you know, even in, in sort of a woke discourse, you notice um, therapy speak permeating it, right? We, uh, yes. there, there, are, there are words like trauma that get over, overused, um, mm -hmm. that these are words that, that you used to, 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 to hear about on your therapist couch, but now it's completely right. normalized. Um, in a and, professional and so this idea setting. of safetyism. Yeah, in a exactly. professional setting, in a, in a conference environment, you know. Correct. It, Diversity not... training, they're talking about traumas. They're, they're talking about traumas yeah. as though, uh, like like racial, historical trauma, like like it's 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 the same kind of trauma you get, say, from being abused by a right. parent. And and I, I think this is very dangerous because it ends up diluting, which this, this is a word that needs to exist. Trauma mm -hmm. is real. But again, like the word racism, it's being diluted. Very much so. And I, I, I always found it to be quite childish, honestly, to see Richard Dawkins speaking at a conference with the same people that use language like they're talking to you like you're a child, you know, and we're right. buying tickets. We're yeah. propping up these organizations. We're propping up these conferences and, and, and tolerating it. We, we tolerated it. Now they don't exist anymore on the most part. Um, and yeah. it's very important. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the bad things is also that, you know, because a lot of these people who join organized atheism also tend to have a persecution complex, right? Because mm -hmm. they felt they were persecuted by their, or marginalized in their religions. Uh, they were, you know, their freedoms were deprived in some ways. Uh, many of them had bad breaks with their families who, you know, controlled who they wanted to date, for example, like you couldn't be gay. And mm -hmm. so legitimately they have a reason, they have a grievance narrative. But the problem is that after they leave atheism, you know, woke ideology came in and supplanted that old grievance narrative with a new one. And yeah. so there's a constant persecution complex and they get drawn into that. Um, and I think that's that's actually one of the reasons why we saw wokeism actually blossom in the atheist movement before uh, before most other places. Mm -hmm. I mean, if for me personally, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You can continue. Oh, no, I, I said, like, for, for me personally, like the, you know, I, I knew something was amiss in the culture when I realized, I mean, my introduction to the atheist movement is actually through Faisal Al-Mutar. Mm -hmm. He, you know, used to be on the conference circuit, came from Iraq as a refugee. I work with him now. He's my co-founder. Well, we found Ideas Beyond Borders together. And he's always been, you know, all about secular humanism. Even when he was living in Iraq, he was blogging. He he had met Christopher Hitchens while he was there. Um, and and obviously when he got here as a refugee, everyone wanted him to speak, right? And, and mm -hmm. he was very well versed, uh, at least on the topic of Islam. And so 
working with him, I got drawn into that too. And what I noticed, what I noticed was, you know, all of a sudden it became racist to talk about these problems. Like it's okay. We could, we could say, we could criticize Christianity all we wanted. In fact, that's almost all we did. We, you know, the standards of that was, was we, you could, I don't know, put a, a Bible into the toilet bowl and that's art today, but we can't even draw a cartoon of prophet Muhammad. Right. Yeah. And, and, and when we, when we do and inflame those ten, those tensions, um, it's our fault for drawing. Like it's, it, it yeah. just seemed it's like we were handling. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That moment, yeah. that Bill Maher moment really encapsulated what was so wrong with intersectionality. I remember back then we didn't have that word. At least I didn't know of that word. But something was wrong and, and you could sense a moral hierarchy. You knew you were not allowed to criticize and it had something to do because remember, that's gross. That's racist. Yeah. So melanin was involved, certainly. And, and the darker the melanin, the more immune from criticism. And, and we saw this very early on in the atheist movement. Very much so. And it led to the ultimate division and destruction of, of the movement and, and, the, and the atheist community. And I want to go into another segment here so uh, to talk about something that I really don't want to talk about, but I think it's necessary, and I think you, you provide a unique perspective. Speaking of division, speaking of destruction of a joint effort against madness, um, being now in this sort of anti-woke community, that we're in on the internet within various different organizations and initiatives. A lot of people from the new atheist movement, at least the, the non-woke types going into this kind of new culture war 2.0 are in. There's, there's been a new split that I've seen happening all throughout the internet and all throughout different events and circuits. We were all kind of united a few years ago after the destruction of yeah. new atheism, seeing what's happening on college campuses throughout the West. Um, the social justice activists causing mayhem Regardless if you were an anti-woke liberal who liked Bill Maher or Sam Harris, or if you were a more libertarian or conservative, there was a bit of, of, of social unification, I would say, to a degree in a professional setting from, I would say, 2016 to even 2020. A little bit of that still exists today. Yeah. The intellectual dark web was coined, for instance. There were, there were a lot of people left and right working together against this nonsense. But I would say going into the 2020 election... I would say issues within the conservative movement and infighting within the conservative movement of who they should associate with certain liberals being uncomfortable with the idea of working with conservatives, certain conservatives being uncomfortable with the idea of working with anti-woke liberals because they think they're not conservative enough. It yeah. led to a rift where I think there can't be a full civilizational wide anti-woke coalition anymore. And I, uh, I know you hold a very similar view to, to myself. I find it to be very, very, very unfortunate because in the scope of politics now in the United States, just being against the idea that men can get pregnant should be a unifying factor amongst all normal people, regardless if you are liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat, right? Yeah. But we have gotten too high on our own egos, in my opinion, which has led us to creating blogs and creating our own riffs, very similar to what we ended up seeing in the atheist community between the woke and unwoke. I think the anti-woke problem, uh, the anti-woke group had the same issue as atheists did when it comes to organizing. And that is, it's very difficult to organize around being against something because mm -hmm. that was the thing that bound everybody. Right. I mean, at some point by year four of going to atheist conference with Faisal, I was like, OK, we all know there's no God. Now what? Like we kind of got bored with the topic. I mean, it, it was really for if somebody had framed it to me like, you know, this is about welcoming new people. Like at the end of the day, there are people always in religions, always looking for answers. And they're going to stumble upon mm -hmm. that one William Lane Craig video where he debates Sam Harris or, or, or and hitch and hitch slaps. You know, he, they get hitch slapped and they opone this person. And, mm -hmm. and that person needs needs a community to 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 you know, find and, and, and put their energies in because they're slowly getting away from their religion. And that's what the, the movement should have been about, actually. Um, but, but 
we we got we lost track. I mean, eventually, if you look at conference topics, it all started to morph into very social justice oriented, like you know, our yeah. uh, black atheism or something like or something like that. That instead of being more universal and and helping people just leaving their religion and forming a support group, mm -hmm. talking about these fundamental facts, it became all about social justice and right? colonial. Yes. Like, what was that doing at an atheist conference, right? And so, I think we see the similar problem with. The intellectual dark web, which is mm -hmm. the intellectual dark web's relationship to new atheism is actually interesting. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it is, I think you're exactly right. The dividing line was atheists who were not anti-woke. So they're mm -hmm. starting to see that there's a new secular religion forming and they didn't want to be a part of it. Yeah. Many of them did gravitate to what, you know, and, and many of the intellectuals like Sam Harris became mm -hmm. um, the pioneers of what actually Barry Wise had you know, written about in the New York Times, which Eric Weinstein had coined mm -hmm. the intellectual dark web. So, uh, you know, that group was at the end of the day bound by what exactly? Bound by the fact that, you know, they were heterodox, uh, they were against whatever. I don't think the words were as um, as uh, concrete yet, but but, mm -hmm. you know, roughly speaking, they were against woke ideology, all of them. Um, and and they held on to certain principles, like the ability to talk and disagree, right? And mm -hmm. I think I think the demise of the IDW is really when these conversations are no longer possible because they're not talking to each other. And I think that's actually one of the, the saddest parts of, of, of what has become of it. It's that the main principle that defined the IDW is now not being honored by the main members of the IDW. And, and and I think it's enough to pronounce that it's dead, you know. Um, but unlike atheism, I don't think the IDW was a movement. This was not a movement in a, in a like neither a social movement nor a political movement. It was really more of a construct of of political commentary of Twitter debate. So mm -hmm. it was more like a branding thing. Um, but but you know, I mean, now that it's on its demise, and I agree with you. I think it's mostly the sk the first schism appeared was uh, was the IDW members that hated Trump and the IDW members who, you know, either didn't mind him or love him. I mean, sometimes not minding him, I, I get criticized for not hating Trump enough. Even though I have criticized him sometimes, mm -hmm. but I've also praised him sometimes. Like when it, when you know yeah. when he, if he did something right, like I think his China policy was great. Um, and he actually, ch you know, had changed what was decades of consensus on the China issue. Mm -hmm. I would praise him, but he's somebody that if you even offer praise or a defense of people are very suspect. And and so they they put you in this camp. Oh, this person, you know, is a, it's a pro-Trump or a secret pro-Trump person. And and that be, that was such a strong dividing line that that it became a huge issue for, for the intellectual dark web. And slowly you start to see the, the anti-Trump people started not talking to the pro-Trump people. Yes. And, um, and then the next thing that really put the nail in the coffin was probably COVID. Um, this whole issue about vaccine mandates and, and, and even just vaccines itself, especially the mm -hmm. mRNA vaccines where, you know, some people of the, some members of the IDW expressed skepticism about the mRNA vaccines was enough. Like mm -hmm. the whole thing right now has pretty much coalesced because they're not talking to each other anymore. And exactly. I, I've, I, you know, yeah. you have you have Joe Rogan on one sense talking about uh, with a little bit of skepticism, uh, you know, towards the COVID vaccines. Originally, he was a little more in the center, but uh, but I've noticed he's he's he, he's changed his mind, I think, a little bit of any. And people are labeling him a conspiracy theorist. Now you have Sam Harris, who I still respect greatly and deeply um, making an entire segment about how plenty of people in, in anti-wokeism or what whatever you want to call it are now, you know, people that, that he doesn't seem to chat with anymore, maybe even not even respect much anymore. There seems to be just a ghosting that is happening. And what's interesting is when myself and others were, were formulating the idea for Atheists for Liberty, the the IDW was still kind of a lie. There was still this semblance of anti-woke left and anti-woke right still working together. And that's something we still intend to do at AFL, regardless if there, you know, there is or isn't some broader movement of thinkers, you know, who can sit politely in a chair in some theater somewhere, uh, being able to talk to one another or not, because we think it's very important. And 
when it comes to civilizational issues like the idea of having proper discourse, it doesn't matter if it was cooler to talk about in 2016 or 2017. It's still yep. important. That's why we're also atheists for liberty, because even though the topic of atheism was cooler to talk about in 2012 and 2013, religion is still shrinking in the United States by a large right. factor. The nuns are still yep. rising, even though it's not sexy to talk about. We still need to talk about it. So we're trying to make sure that all these important conversations still are had regardless of trends. And these thinkers that could have helped propel these discussions more, it's just a shame that they're not communicating with each other more because they could really bring thousands upon thousands more people across the West into this conversation to help us save the very society that we love. Um, yeah, I, you just you just said something that I think is very key. So I, I respect, you know, I respect Sam. I do too. I just don't understand why we're at a point where somebody has one wrong opinion, literally just one. Mm -hmm. But you, th their whole body of work is has been over like two decades and, and you've agreed with most of it. But this one thing, this vaccine issue or something you disagree with, or maybe the yeah. promotion of ivermectin. And all of a sudden, he, that person's not worth talking to. Like, why mm -hmm. do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? There's this political purity almost. It's like the, in my one of my, my co-hosts mm -hmm. for the FAIR podcast, which is launching next month, Angel Eduardo, he calls it the political one-drop rule. One drop of of blood, of, of bad opinions is, is mm -hmm. enough to taint the entire person to the point that we don't even want to have them at, over at dinner. And this is precisely what the IDW was conceived to address. And, and so it, it's very tragic to me. What's interesting is also what you mentioned about this rise of the left anti-woke. I'm actually starting to see that a lot more. You mm -hmm. have people with explicitly leftist politics, Glenn Greenwald, um, Zaid Jelani, Matt Taibbi, Freddie mm -hmm. DeBoer. Freddie DeBoer is an outright Marxist. And, and, and all of them, all of these people have come out very strongly, in fact, more strongly, against woke than some of the, the right leaning people. Right. And it's it's very interesting to see. For them, I think their their fervor is coming from the fact that they feel that race racial issues is hindering the fight for class issues. And they're absolutely mm -hmm. right. There certainly is that. So so we are starting to see and but you know none of these people are broadly speaking in the in the atheist movement, but politically you are starting to see this this left the rise of the left anti-woke and i i'm i'm i for one i'm very happy because this shouldn't be just a right-wing thing it's like free no, speech it free speech should never have been a right-wing issue unfortunately it, it got ceded to the right yeah. um the left had given it up so you know who could blame who could blame the people for seeing it that way um but it's really the left's fault it is the left's fault and, and could you know for many conservatives and libertarians who are watching this you need the anti-woke liberals. You need these people to, to grow their platform and to continue because there are going to be so many people who just do not want to get on board. So, uh, so and speaking of that, when it comes to um, FAIR, by the way, everybody check out the FAIR podcast that's going to be coming out soon. I'm going to tune in myself. I, I'm, I think I'm going to be a, a big fan pretty quickly. Um, you know, there are some people who don't even want to join FAIR sometimes because there, there are some people who think FAIR isn't right wing enough. So there are a lot of people that are anti-CRT that see fair as O2 liberal. But for the That's conservatives true. and libertarians who are watching, you need to understand that some people will not associate with you because you are right wing. I think it's stupid, too. I think it's silly. But what are we going to do? Are we going to have all these heterodox liberals who have a platform, have money, have an education, have intelligence? Are we going to leave them out in the dust? And are we only ourselves going to fight against wokeness? Yeah. That's poor strategy. Yeah. That's piss poor strategy. Well, the, the problem is that anything, you know, that it used to be that alt-right, well, you're like, oh, this person's alt-right, and then it was that mm -hmm. person was bad because of the association right. with the word, maps onto evil, so you're bad. Mm -hmm. Now the word conservative itself is bad. And I've, I've fought for this because I think that's actually very dangerous. You'll see, uh, say, for example, with the whole Virginia elections, the it was dismissed. The concerns that parents had about critical race theory were actually dismissed as a conservative talking point or a conservative mm -hmm. conspiracy theory. But you see what they're doing when they portray it like that. I mean, the word, if, if anything associated with conservative became bad. So that word in and of itself became just synonymous with evil. It's, it's a, like a euphemism treadmill. And and. This is the point where we're at right now, where where 
it's very easy to brush something off, not address it. If you just say some something or someone is conservative. Oh, that person appeared on Fox News. You can forget everything else he said, right? And, and so this yeah. is now the what we have for discourse. And it's very equivalent to the phenomenon I was talking about before. It's the, it's the one drop rule. You know, you're I not know allowed to deviate. Yeah. I, I know of people who specifically will not go on Fox News and will not go on The Blaze and will not go on The Daily Wire specifically because the moment they appear on those shows they will be labeled as right wingers and will be and will be turned off by by half their audience it's actually speaking of sam harris he ended up stating to ben affleck after the the 2014 incident you call you calling me racist alienates 50 percent of people automatically wow. from, from liking my yeah. content and liking what i'm saying and it's right. it's sort of the same it's the sad reality hence why we need to have outlets like fair hence why we well, need I, to I, I will i will say though that that moment red pilled mm -hmm. a lot of people so so sam is definitely right right like yeah. I've, i for example yasmin mohammed who who's an amazing um activist and political commentator as well she and also actually on the board of, of atheist for liberty that was her moment where she she saw that happen on bill maher and said like i need to speak out yeah. i have friends one of them is a very famous hollywood director who who said, you know what, I didn't want to, he was a secular Jew, didn't want to talk about these issues, but he's like, that moment woke me up. It shook me because I realized like, oh my gosh, if this is the way people yeah. are thinking and this is the response to what Sam said by a mainstream person on national TV, like something mm -hmm. is wrong. That's and really so wrong. while that was crazy and, you know, I'm Sam was right, it tarred his reputation, it did actually cause a lot of people to open their eyes that was their red pill moment so it was my red you know pill. i think it might wow. might really okay yeah see there it you was, go it was, i was uh, i was 16 i was in high school i was i was a big bill maher fan watching God, every week so with young. my progressive friend jacob i uh, i was i was talking to jacob before we we, we um took the late uh, buses home and i told mm -hmm. jacob are you tuning in to bill maher tonight hell yeah i'm tuning into bill maher it's gonna be it's gonna be fun it's gonna be a blast I, I see it live. I saw what what happened then. This is, I believe, in October of 2014. And yes. the following morning, and I was starting to get involved in, online in the atheist community and eventually go, joining organizations and being part of national committees and national organizations. My 1,000 like, 1, list of Facebook friends, so many of them within the movement, national leaders, state leaders, local leaders, were attacking Sam Harris attacking Sam Harris all throughout my Facebook feed the following day for daring to criticize the religion of Islam, just like they criticized the religion of Christianity. And I knew at that very moment that something was wrong. And then when I saw so many other people in alternate media start to really talk about this issue more deeply, it, uh, sort of a, a frustration and anger at why we can't criticize this was growing. I knew that I needed to get involved in that debate even more. I just, I didn't know how because I was so deeply entrenched in an atheist movement that was slowly but surely getting taken over by wokeism every second. That's exactly what happened. If you look at all the ex-Muslim atheists, they were sidelined out of the atheist oh. movement very early. All of them, you know, Sarah Hader, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Yasmin Muhammad, every single one of them sidelined. Because they, you were not allowed to criticize a brown religion, ultimately. That's really what it comes down to. And, and they had the gall to do it. And of course, you know, this very simplistic way of looking at the world at a very fixed moral hierarchy of mm -hmm. intersecting identities that are marginalized completely ignores the minority of a minority, right? The people persecuted by, you know, you're supposed to be speaking truth to power, but mm -hmm. here there was a power, a totalitarian, a totalitizing ideology that's marginalizing other people. They're speaking out, but that's, because that's they're homophobic, it, you know? All the yep. things that would trigger the red flags, but because, yeah, because it's a brown person's religion, you can't criticize it at all. And uh, Which makes no sense, because like, you care about progressivism or you don't, right? And right. so shouldn't you be criticized? Like, how? The mental gymnastics baffles me, because it, it takes a lot of effort to to bend your mm -hmm. mind to to embrace this. I think well, that's what's the funny part about all this, mostly. What's great, and I saw this. So people like myself, we started getting attacked. The, the, the white guys who were who were starting to criticize the political correctness and then the, mm -hmm. the, the the Islam defense, defense of Islam, we started getting attacked and bashed first. 
right? So the anti-woke conservatives, the anti-woke liberals, the, uh, the anti-woke libertarians and the anti-woke liberals, so we were thrown out first. But then you had Faisal and a few others who, 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 relu- who, who a lot of the woke people still reluctantly kept on their friends list. I saw a bunch of these Antifa activists within the atheist community going like, oh, it's Faisal. He's being so silly right now, whatever. So it's okay. It was okay for an extra few years for Faisal to still criticize it and get on their nerves just a little bit by saying the exact same things that we were saying. Right, right. Um, yep. he was last, There's was a the difference last tolerance more. level. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But then no, but he, like, got kicked out of, he got kicked out of the students' uh, secular student alliance. Student alliance. Yeah. yeah, I got my start. Among other things. Alliance. Um, which is which is <laughs> which is uh, definitely a funny uh, situation, and and so I'm thinking when it comes to totalitarianism and when it comes to that all this stuff, um, I think uh, I, I, I was trying to figure out a great way to jump to the next topic, but I think I'll just do it. Um, when before I go to bed every night, um, I my I, I go on TikTok. I find TikTok to be this really entertaining, fun app. I know a lot of people say, well, well, wait, it's a Chinese app. I know. I was going to say that you're being spied on. Well, I'm a hypocrite, but I love the app. It's fun. I so I, I scroll on my newsfeed before I go to bed every night, and, and and I'm on an apolitical account. Like I don't follow political content. I don't follow atheist content on this account. This is just like I watch like business videos, dancing, memes, and okay. dancing, and like couples memes. Like that. That's why I check okay. out on my TikTok. And as I'm scrolling through my randomly generated newsfeed, you pop up. You actually pop up quite a few times, and you've actually become quite popular. On TikTok, because I'm not on your TikTok of China, even though you don't have an account on there, um, you've become quite popular due to your critiques of China. People have clipped out your um, clips on being on the Joe Rogan podcast, rightfully criticizing the Chinese regime and what it's doing. These people on TikTok and Zoomers, people in my generation, see you as the expert on Chinese authoritarianism, and it's becoming an ever increasing topic. It's why you talk about it more now than ever. Your background makes a lot of sense as to why also it's appropriate for you to discuss these matters. So I'd like to go into that um, because I will admit I'm even quite ignorant on the topic. I focus a lot on domestic issues. I focus a lot on culture war stuff. The, what, the things that I know is that China is an authoritarian, state atheistic, Marxist regime. Um, they uh, have a very aggressive foreign policy with the island building and also with um, giving Taiwan quite a lot of problems. Um, but also from a religious perspective, attacking Uyghurs and Christians, and that they are pretty much doing exactly what the Stalinists did decades prior and what the Nazis did decades before that. Um, If you could just go into a little bit of detail as to how important from a religion-related or religious thinker's perspective um, the threat of China is, and, and why we as people who discuss religion, even domestically in the United States, should focus on the threat of China. I'll say one one thing before I go into that, and that is, you know, you said you you focus on domestic issues and culture wars. Mm-hmm. Well, China is related to everything. It's almost mm-hmm. downstream of it. All that is downstream of the China issue in a way. If you kind of peel back mm-hmm. the curtain, see where these ideologies are coming from, who is fomenting the culture wars, who is using the culture war as a cudgel. Um, you know, I mean, to be honest, like one of the one of the issues here is also that how do we prevail in an ideological struggle when our dominant, you know, dominant culture is so self-loathing. Like we, right. we're not even confident in our own values, right? So, and, and we're in competition with China. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, to answer your question about, about the um, religion issue, at the end of the day, a country that has freedom of speech also has freedom of religion. They are one and the same, they go together. And a country like China that has a firewalled internet, everything is controlled. You know, if you went on Weibo or, or Chinese social media, you tried to type Tiananmen, you'll get, it won't be, you won't be able to post it. You know, it's been scrubbed from their, you won't get pictures of it. It's been scrubbed from their search engine. Hmm. Um, Wikipedia, you can't even look, look it up on Wikipedia in China. Um, so it, it's like there there are events that are so toxic to to you know the collective memory of Chinese citizens that the government is actively suppressing it, right? Mm-hmm. And you think about the the way they're controlling speech. This is exactly aligned with how they're controlling religion as well. And and ultimately the reason for that is speech and religion are seen as as dangerous, right? They can you you can challenge power with either mm-hmm. religion. 
um, in many cases, can also supplant the state. I think that has always been the concern of Marxists um, who prize the state above all else. I mean, you know, Karl Marx himself said that religion was the opiate of the masses. He had like mm -hmm. disrespect for religion in general. Um, ignoring, of course, the, the natural human impulse to believe, right? And so there have been scores of sort of anti-woke atheists, even like people like Michael Shermer, who have now come to the idea that, you know, we all advocate for a world with less religion in it. We think that'll be better. But mm -hmm. many of us who came from that, that uh, perspective in the atheist movement are now questioning that because we're seeing secular religions form. We're seeing... Um, this wokeness kind of take on the features of religion in a way that that's making us question that that previous position we held on on the secularization of the world. We don't know, right? Because it seems like there's there is a human need to believe and find community and 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 they will latch onto another thing that looks like religion. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what's happening in totalitarian states, North Korea is one, China is one. You know, the state is the religion. They. They, they claim they're state atheists, but they worship Xi Jinping. The the techniques used is religious in a way. Mm -hmm. There's blasphemy. You know, you can't even paste Winnie the Pooh because that's blasphemous. Right. I mean, to be honest, I, I, I think that the fact that we don't have um, a, a, a CXI variant for COVID is because it happens to coincide with Xi Jinping's name. So we had to mm -hmm. skip two letters. We made such a huge... Um, you know, concession to do something like that, mm -hmm. just so we don't, you know, we, we don't blaspheme the leader. Um, and so you see like trappings of religion, um, same with, with North Korea. Uh, so I, I don't think that, you know, I, 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 I do think that even though they claim to be an atheist state, like they are still acting like a totalitarian theocracy. There really is no difference. And I'm so glad Iran and China. I'm so glad you mentioned that because optics wise, we we get attacked by by some, uh, you know, social religious conservatives sometimes even still because, oh, you're an atheist organization. <laughs> well, atheism leads to Marxism. So <laughs> good luck on your adventures. I'm going to mock you a little bit on the side. And I hate that. I hate that because the vast majority of, of, of atheists in the United States, I would even argue, don't belong to the woke cult that took over the atheist community and certainly don't belong to holding any loyalties to the Chinese communist regime or the North Korean regime. We are actively opposed to that. You know, we are not atheists because we are Marxists. We're, you know, it's, it's, it's very ridiculous. And I think more of us need to speak up against that. Hence why the topic of atheism should still be talked about from a positive sense and not fully ditched just because we're in a different culture war. Um, Angel wanted me to mention this. Uh, he thinks it's a great moment to bring up the toppling of the pillar of Sham Tiananmen, and Tiananmen Square. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's my second slip up on a stream here already, everybody. I'm going to clip that out sometime. Uh, Tiananmen Square sculpture in Hong Kong. Uh, he, he, he thinks you would have more commentary on that as well. This is another example of just the lengths at which China is going to erase the memory of Tiananmen. You really have to question why. Why do they? Because they, they really care so much. You can't even type in the date, June fourth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just that sequence of numbers is banned. Your account gets mm -hmm. banned. Um, and, and you know, I, I, at the end of the day, what what it's coming down to is moral authority. Um, mm -hmm. The the Chinese government is is. First and foremost, I mean, they don't have elections. They're not a democracy. So one of the issues for them has always been this issue of legitimacy. Are they the legitimate government of, of you know, of China? And then you have Taiwan that's challenging that status as, you know, the, the rightful government of China. And so so Xi Jinping is, is has always been trying to weed out anything that that would make that would make people question that legitimacy. That's why he cares so much about working with, you know, international bodies like the UN, like the WHO, because all of that only seeks to legitimize his rule. Um, and Tiananmen and really bad things in the past, in China's past, I mean, even Mao Zedong, right? One thing that's always been baffling to me is how has Mao Zedong been able to rehabilitate his image such that he is anything but a genocidal maniac who honestly Number deserves one, a, a reputation worse than Hitler. 
But yeah. we don't have that because he was not a right wing dictator. He was a left wing one. Therefore, Somehow people still wearing Mao shirts like, right. you know, he's some liberator. Yeah. But but if you look at his impact on history, the, the atrocities, they are worse than Hitler in magnet in, in actual quantity. Um, but but this is one of those like my sort of like weird moral myopia is that I think has never been resolved because of this left wing, right wing blinders that we have. And so we excuse, oh, at least their intentions were good. They were trying to, you know, weed out class. And, and so the cultural revolution where he basically, you know, exterminated many intellectuals and, and the bourgeois, you're not allowed to be bourgeois. Like that was fine. Right. Um, that really baffles me, but, but, Coming back to Tiananmen, it, it really does strike me how much, what efforts, what lengths the, the regime goes to, to just purge the memory of Tiananmen. Um, it's as if, imagine if the United States had tried to weed out, I don't know, all mentions of slavery, all, like we, mm -hmm. we couldn't even talk about it, right? And so in, in a weird way, what we have is like a, a country that, that we're geopolitical rivals with, that is actively purging its history, maintaining this pristine, perfect narrative, giving its citizens a lot of confidence, moral authority. And then our country, which is so free <laughs> that we're, we're now, you know, enshrining 1619 project. We gave it a Pulitzer Prize, its author of like, you know, history that historians have debunked. Um, and and we're, we're we're doing the opposite. We're doing the exact opposite, and and you know, indoctrinating our students into mm -hmm. believing or hating America, um, and and it's it's the complete opposite. And so now these two countries are rivals. And while who has we're a strategic ourselves. advantage? Exactly. So who has a strategic advantage, right? And China. and I don't know whether you saw the the work of Christopher Rufo. He revealed in one of the document dumps that he did that China's been funding a lot of this um, critical race theory infused K to twelve curriculum. Oh, I believe it. Are we surprised? No. No. Uh, you probably know this uh, more than anybody. I uh, I loved looking at the different military ads that came out just a few months ago. The comparison between the Chinese army ad and the U.S. Mm -hmm. army ad. The Chinese army ad. These guys are badass. They take they're taking their job very seriously. They're tough. They're they're advertising the military like it's the place for you to be a man, right? You have a you have a, a lot of Chinese men out there now. So the military is giving them a purpose, especially since it's very statistically unlikely that a gigantic chunk of them are going ever going to find a meet a mate within their lives. So they're taking their foreign policy directives very seriously. They're taking military recruitment very seriously. They are prohibiting children from playing video games for a certain period of time uh, during certain parts of the day. You probably know more than me, but they're they're not they're, they're taking everything seriously. Us, we're eating ourselves. We're making our military weak. Uh, yeah. We are we are we are caring more about diversity quotas within the U.S. military now. This this was the atheist community in 2011. Now we're talking about the U.S. military and U.S. Congress. Now, um, yeah. it makes me scared on a foreign policy front. I think it's something that that those who care about liberty and atheists, especially uh, from a perspective of those who discuss and critique religion, who care about liberty, should care about. Even though we uh, we mostly still focus on domestic issues, you're right. China is poking their necks and poking their heads into every little thing we do, including that nice little app that I like to watch before I go to bed, which is annoying. But at least people are getting. Uh, at least people <laughs> are are learning about you and your work as a result of it. And I think I think. We're definitely going to have you on in the future to discuss probably more specific issues in relation to China as not only the culture wars proceed forward, but as our to. messy foreign policy does as we continue into the century. Um, it's not an issue going away. So, yeah, I'll be happy to come back, talk about it. We're going to need you. Yeah. So I think it's a good, uh, this is a good time for us to move on into the Q&A portion. We're going to we're going to be uh, having on for another 27 to 30 minutes uh, Q&A, answering people's questions in the live chat. I'm looking forward to uh, all of that. Uh, Angel, if you, uh, you want to put up some questions and comments, we'll platform them and we'll discuss from there. Play the Jeopardy theme. Do, 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 do. Oh, I missed it today. 
I need to get back into it more. Although, you know, with, with Trebek not on there anymore, it's, it's in my opinion, it's just it's not as tough, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mars, how are you doing? All right, we got Mars Chung asking the following question. At Atheist Liberty, question for Melissa. Because of the spread of wokeism, are you seeing the Ben Affleck effect applied to other issues? I saw something similar happen in a discussion about China. The Ben Affleck uh, Affleck effect. So the that's gross, that's racist. Oh yeah, for sure. And and China knows what they're doing by inflaming. So <laughs> there is a huge conflation. You know how criticizing Islam was Islamophobia. There is a growing sense that criticizing China is Sinophobia. And 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 the Chinese know what they're doing. Like they know that they can play this race card because it is it is such a sensitive issue. It's a weak point in American multicultural society. And they know they can hammer this home and they're doing it. Look at, at a very simple case. Uh, let's look at what happened early on in the pandemic. It was considered racist to even entertain the idea that COVID-19 might have originated from the lab in Wuhan. And we went on for about one and a half years until John Stewart said so, that it was ridiculous that an outbreak happened to be in the same area as a BL4 top level research, viral research institute. Why didn't we look at that? It wasn't until he said that on, on mainstream television that all of a sudden the berries came down and it was okay to talk about it. And, and now it wasn't racist. But when we look at what happened at the beginning, how the consensus, how the scientific community, with the help of Peter Daszak at EcoHealth Alliance and a lot of other government officials that were colluding and scientists, that narrative became completely out of bounds. And that is exactly the, the that's gross, that's racist moments for the China issue. You see that very clearly because it became that's racist to talk about a genuine issue, which is what are the or origins of COVID-19? And so and this desire to not be racist can be very harmful for society. It might have cost us the ability to even know where this came from. It's, it's very And you're right now. in that China knows exactly what it's doing, because I think most Americans sadly don't know that that people from Taiwan are technically Chinese. They're, you know, it used to be the Republic of China before Mao took over in the late 40s and, and yeah. moved them all there. Or where they all escaped. Right, exactly. Um, uh, yeah. Chiang Kai-shek. Yep. Yeah. Sinophobia, yeah. though. Right. <laughs> No, it's a thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. But of course, they're going to use every bit of that to their advantage. Right, right. But but I mean, you know, and, and there's also now anti-Asian hate, right, which came up as, as a thing during the pandemic because of all these uh, attacks and, and shunning incidents. So that's another thing to that. That's another form of xenophobia. Not to say that there aren't legitimate incidents of, of mm -hmm. Asians being, you know, pummeled because they're Asians. There are cases like that, obviously, but but that those issues are going to be conflated with criticisms of China. Big time. Absolutely. All right. Next uh, next question, comment. Always the bias from the events manager. It's just like a tradition at this point. All right, Angel. I think this is a very good question and we didn't really talk about this much earlier. Can you briefly comment on the plight of Uyghurs and Christians in China? Like most religions in China, there are some exceptions. Um, you know, the, the Uyghur Muslims and, and many Protestants are are heavily persecuted in China. They're not allowed to practice their religion. Um, the Uyghurs really have it worse in a sense. It's, it, it's very systematic what they're trying to do. And partly, you know, it's because um, Uyghur identity is associated with this idea of separatism, that they want some sort of independence from the Chinese state. And that's something that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party will never entertain. And so they have enacted these, uh, they, they keep them in a region, the region where they live in Xinjiang, they do not have freedom of movement. In fact, journalists that go to Xinjiang are heavily fall, surveilled, they are followed, their movements are controlled. So we don't even really have a clear picture of what's going on there, except for the feckless reporting by reporters that have access to satellite imagery. So we know stuff because we can see you know, from satellite. And what it looks like is prison compounds, detention centers where 
several, you know, activists who have escaped um, describe as as re-education camps where they're sent there. Many of them are also, you know, forced to um, to sell their labor. So Xinjiang is very resource rich. Cotton grows there, um, tomatoes, sugar, and and now labor is a very important uh, input. So factories built, you know, factories that uh, Nike relies on, that Campbell Soup relies on, um, they are now using this labor, uh, indentured labor in a way, from from the Uyghurs um, to make the products that that you and I are buying, right? And so, thankfully, lately the U.S. government actually, um, I think Biden is about to sign it, a bipartisan bill um, to end forced labor coming up from from the from Uyghurs. Um, is about to be signed. So at, le- at least I, I'm happy to say that the U.S. is doing something about it. Um, yet, I will say the bill was delayed by two years because companies like Nike, um, all these woke companies like Coca-Cola, because remember sugar comes from Xinjiang, have lobbied against Congress from passing it. So they care a lot about the legacy of, of slavery here in America, but they're not doing anything about slavery modern day slavery that exists right now in Xinjiang because it hurts their bottom line. They're afraid of supply chain shocks and everything. Um, oh, by the way, Apple also is one of those companies. Uh, this is segue into like woke capitalism. I'll end there. Um, but when it comes to Christians, um, you know, they're persecuted too. They're, they're not allowed to freely practice their religion. The Catholics are because the Catholics acquiesce to having um, the, the CCP actually pick out uh, their local cardinal or bishop or something that monitors everything. And so in a way, the, the state has eyes on Catholicism. Mm-hmm. That's not true. Christianity, uh, Protestantism is, is very diffuse. There's no central authority, so the state can't really keep eyes on it. In fact, there is a Chinese version of the Bible. Um, so they don't actually let the actual Christian Bible circulate in China. Mm-hmm. Um, they rewrote the Christian Bible and and rewrote some stories because they didn't like that Jesus was above the state or something like that. If the look into, look the at, Here's yeah, the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so look into the Chinese rewrite of the Christian Bible. It's actually kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, the the Christians, the Falun Gong, these are all you know persecuted re- religions. And any state that that does that also obviously doesn't have freedom of speech. Like I said, it's it's uh, they go hand in hand. Christopher Baker asks Melissa, who has influenced your politics and philosophy? Ooh, that's like a very singular person. Um, I actually would say that the experience of growing up in Singapore has a very big impact on me, obviously. You know, we're products of our environment and our, our, where we came from. Um, but it was unique because I didn't grow up with a sense of left wing and right wing you could write an entire thesis of whether Singapore is either. Um, at the end of the day, it was always pragmatic. Uh, there's very low taxes, no capital gain taxes. So you would, you would think it's right wing, right? Mm-hmm. But then 80% of the country also lives in public housing. So a lot of socialized housing. So is it left wing or right wing? You know, it's like, so we didn't have wings. And I never saw politics this way in this very binary, two-dimensional way. Um, so you know, we always looked at outcomes, like what does a policy incentivize at the end of the day? And what, what does it disincentivize? Does it work? Um, if, if there was a vice that you wanted to curtail, does implementing a certain tax do that, for example? Um, I never saw these issues as left-wing or right-wing. And I think that's been very helpful in shaping um, my ideology. But, but obviously I would say the Enlightenment philosophers were a huge impact. I think that the Enlightenment is one of the biggest drivers of true progressive values, tolerance for minorities, um, you know, just allowing people to speak freely, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, of conscience. All of these things were driven by the Enlightenment and also, you know, ideas in governance like separation of of church and state, um, separation of powers. Uh, the drive to to go beyond monarchy and aristocracy and go towards democracy was certainly plant seeds planted during the Enlightenment, um, and also just free market capitalism. So Enlightenment ideals very much drove that. But I also recognize um, the the failures and the hubris of the Enlightenment, and am now in tune to 
you know, what you would call neoclassical reactionism that has, has the enlightenment gone too far? You know, are, are there reasons to, to look back at Rome or, or Greece and, and, and sort of probe are, are there, are there, has liberalism kind of been too free in a way mm -hmm. that it's hard to fight authoritarianism. I, I mean, this is, you know, ironic, but we're, we're facing that right now in the sense we're living at a time where there is really an unprecedented rise in authoritarianism around the world. Like we were going one way, the trend, you know, like Steven Pinker's and Lyman now, Battle Angels on One Nature, that trend was just going one way. Liberal democracy was really going to be seen as the, the end, the, the, the end of history, right? Francis Fukuyama said that. And it was so clear that we were heading there, but all of a sudden there was this weird turn and, and, and we're regressing. And I'm, I'm very interested in finding out why this is happening and looking at the schisms. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, still, I'm still exploring that part of, of philosophy that will lead me to, to those kinds of answers. Overall, I think that it's dangerous though if we curtail the progression of the enlightenment or the progression of enlightenment values. You know, I've seen, I've been seeing this conversation happening in conservatism um, where there is this yearning to go back to, and these, these are by some fringe people, some extremists, but even some extreme zoomers wanting to go back to this classical conservatism of wanting monarchy of wanting our society to be similar now to modern Saudi Arabia or modern Afghanistan. And I think it's a very, very dangerous precedent to go in that direction just because, you know, what, the, the far left and social justice warriors have curtailed our society, so we should literally give them the exact argument as to why they should continue their madness? No, yeah. that's not a game I want to yeah. play. I, 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 I try to tell people whenever I go on certain shows, I don't want to shoot myself with, you know, one gun that's larger or one gun that's smaller. I want to shoot myself with no gun at all. Um, it, even if that risks us losing, I'd still like us to stick to our principles even if we risk losing it all at the end of the day, because you do only live once. Right. But, you know, what you brought up about Xi Jinping, for example, being able to unilaterally say, you know what, as a society, we're, we're going to decide that video games are harmful or not productive. And we can just say, like, don't do it. We're going to institute a, a time limit. These are actions that that in the liberal democracy, you just, just can't really do. Right? right. So in the liberal democracy, you're optimizing for for liberty and and a society like what china has can optimize for outcomes that are beneficial to national interests at the time and so in a in a in a situation where you have two countries competing at the end of the day one kind of strategy is going to be more adaptive in the context of the competition mm -hmm. that is what i worry about and, and that it is an inherent disadvantage because a closed society can always hack the openness of an open society, but an open society can almost never do anything about a closed society. There are structural disadvantages to this fight. And, and so just even take out the woke thing, like which is, I think is a national security threat. Personally, I really do. Oh, but I take agree. that out. There are already inherent structural disadvantages that we're up against. Now you add the woke thing and it's a huge handicap. We're fighting with one arm behind our backs. Yeah, big time. Speaking of national security, they've even infiltrated the CIA. So it's uh, it's not a fun, it's interesting yeah. to talk about on a, on a podcast and a stream, but <laughs> in the context of wanting to make sure our civilization continues, it's not fun at all. But uh, right, very good exactly. point. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was it? Oh, uh, Mars, Mars quickly mentioned here. The incident I was privy to was seeing a friend criticize Xi Jinping. The friend got called a racist for calling him out for human rights abuses, human rights abuses. Yeah. Yep, exactly. All well, right. You know, I would say also like Black Lives Matter did not call out Jesse Smollett for what he did. Like they actually no. doubled down on the, so, so this is exactly the, the myopia you know, you're in, unable to to make moral judgments because your moral judgment is completely tied to skin color. Yeah. It, yeah. And this happened just in the atheist movement as well. Um, I remember when there was this one Australian woman within the atheist community. This was in 2013, 14. Um, a few of the historians within the within AFL will definitely be able to comment on me. There was this one woman. Uh, I, I could be totally wrong. 
for the record, Karen Stalls now, I remember, I think that's her name. She lied about sexual harassment or sexual assault within within the atheist community, within, I believe, the CFI sphere of things. Yeah. Um, you had numerous woke bloggers, Elevator Gate style uh, bloggers defending uh, defending her. And then when proof was actually shown that she was lying about the whole thing and when a settlement was was made, it was all rushed under the rug. There was no comments on it whatsoever because it doesn't fit with their woke narrative. Yep. Okay. TJ Tuttle asks, Melissa, hey. have you pondered and Gibbs, Melissa and Gibbs, how about this? I guess the question is for both of you now. Have you pondered the implications of an AI controlled moderation in human interaction and does it scare you? Do you mean like discourse being moderated online by by AI, right? Um, yes, of course. I mean, not that I think human moderation is any better, but at least there's discretion uh, with AI controlled. Everything depends on on inputs and the data set that you're training training the AI on. Um, yeah, no, I I'm not in favor of of moderated anything if it's coming to uh, social media. Um, algorithms, because I, I do think that that's a way to throttle to throttle certain kinds of speech, de facto censorship, um, and it's it's very dangerous. I, I think now what we're seeing is a bit of a, a tech lash, right? There there are there are people who are so concerned about what happened. For example, I think it's ridiculous that um, Donald Trump was booted off Twitter permanently, like still booted off now. Yeah. But you can read the tweets of Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, the Taliban are on it. Like it, it makes, it really makes no sense to me. Um, you know, members of the the Chinese Communist Party can tweet, but their countrymen don't even have access to Twitter, and we can reach them, but they can reach us because they don't allow Twitter in their country. So there's this fundamental asymmetry and weird moral, you know, just hypocrisy that's going on here, and and any attempts to to um, kind of use AI only scales this up and makes this infinitely worse. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I am not fluent on the subject at all. But um, it's going to be one that, from a political science perspective, gets us on the debating table for another two decades at least. Yeah. All right. Next question. Christopher Baker asks, have you heard Peter Zihan's comments about China? He says they have an Enron-style accounting system. He has called China a paper tiger. You know, paper tigers can still cause paper cuts. Um, I have heard Peter Zihan's comments. It's there are, there are some people that think that China is built on a house of cards, and we don't really have to worry that much because it will implode. And, you know, recent events like what happened with the Evergrande, um, the, the real estate company that went into huge debt, um, you know, the West, Western media was calling it their Lehman Brothers moment. Um, but, but look at the systemic risk so far. That so-called Lehman Brothers moment did not actually cause, you know, a, a recession like our Lehman Brothers moment actually did in, in 2008. Um, the, the Chinese government having full control is still very well equipped to to force certain things, even if they're just illusions, um, even though, you know, really no reasonable person even begins to trust the numbers that the Chinese government puts out, even for GDP growth and things like that. Um, but because their control is so complete, I, I don't see how China is going to collapse on its own if we just left let it at the end of the day you know the chinese government can almost engineer any outcome because its control is so um so complete so i i'm not convinced that we can just sit back relax and let let things unfurl and you know the chinese won't innovate i mean we've been saying that for a long time that oh china doesn't have any freedom they don't even allow their their people the freedom of speech so their scientists can't innovate well they don't have to they have used force technology transfer they have used corporate espionage they have stolen ip they don't have to innovate and actually when it comes to innovating guess what they're actually really good at ai they are far beyond the 
where the U.S. should be um, on at least in the domain of AI. And if that's where the next fourth industrial revolution will be won, they're already ahead. I have a feeling that the vast majority of these questions are nearly all going to be about China, but we're trying to answer everybody's questions as fast as possible here. Eva asks, Melissa, what is more urgent? Defanging China or destroying wokeism? you know, one will help the other. Destroying wokeism actually helps defanging China. It's really hard to do it when wokeism is the predominant ideology in all our institutions because, because it prevents us from having that moral authority um, it causes the younger generation to hate their country and not be confident in the values of that country. And those values are very important as we confront China, because if, if we don't have confidence in what the United States stands for, I don't know what we're fighting. You won't even know what you're fighting for at the end of the day. And that gives China a huge advantage because they know what they're fighting for. It's very clear. And I'm, you know, concerned about I mean, in, in a way, it might be already like a little too late. If you think about all the domains that the Chinese have infiltrated, university systems, um, you know, the, like you said, the military, corporate America. Um, we've had just yesterday, the Harvard uh, chemistry chair, Charles Lieber, was, uh, I think, charged. I think he's going to be sent to prison for for lying about his connections to you know the, the Chinese Communist Party. They were paying him for for research, and he didn't disclose them on, on the forms. So this is the kind of both actually um, actually there's also soft power plays that that China has been involved in. Um, re, you know the Confucius Institutes, the Belt and Road Initiative, trapping other countries into debt trap into debt traps. They've been doing this for a long time, and and we've been asleep at the wheel. Right. It wasn't until like, I don't know, President Trump came in office like 2016, 17, that rhetoric about China started heating up and yeah. and China was being called out for what it was actually doing. The Obama administration was way, way too nice and didn't hold China to account. So in a way, it's a little too late. But if we if wokeism is, you know, is going to lose popularity and, and the next generation just it completely repudiates it, I think we really have a chance. Um, so that would be my optimistic. And, and I think numbers are on our side. I actually don't think that majority of Americans yet are, are captivated by, by wokeism. They, they are just loud and shrill. But mm -hmm. if enough people have courage and speak out, I think we, we have time. So I guess it relates to this question. Autumn Berend asks here, how do you suggest we best go about dealing with China and its influence on our society? From the government standpoint, you know, we we have we're still we still have to conform to all these liberal values, right? That we embrace, so we can't not be America. You know, the what we can do is pass certain bills, like um, you know, say for example, um, recently Congress said, okay, if there's a Chinese company cannot be a part of manufacturing any components that go into our electrical grid, it's a national security issue. That we can do, but from a consumer standpoint, the only other thing that we can do in line with our values is inform consumers. And at the end of the day, like American products, you know, are less attractive right now because of cost issues. But if people understood that there was a greater reason for buying American, you know, take a little hit. It's going to be a bit more expensive. Amazon Prime is great. You're going to get it in like two days. But yeah. On the other hand, many of these products are actually directly coming from China and you're selling out Main Street, right? And, and, and putting small businesses out to the to pasture. Um, but I think if, if, if Americans realize that this was actually the patriotic thing to do, that, that we could do it. And big part of this is actually um, empowering consumers with the knowledge. For example, I read recently that Marriott Hotel lines, you know, totally kowtow to China regarding um, Taiwan. They listed Taiwan um, not as a separate country or something like that. And, mm. and you know, under those circumstances, if you can avoid Marriott, if, you know, with consumer power, you can make 
the companies um, lose that that PR sheen and, and realize that like, hey, boycotting actually works. MBA is a very good example. The MBA is really suffering in terms of ratings. So you know, consumers have more power than than they than than um, than companies think. We got uh, one other question coming on up, and then I think we'll end the show for this evening. Amber Boss asks, or her comment rather, said, it seems to me that a part of the schism in current anti-woke atheism stems from people embracing a heterodox identity above all. How do you guard against people slipping into reflexive contrarianism? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. You know, I think that there will always be a, a class of people who will just try to disagree with whatever the, the establishment is. Anti-establishment is, is, is a very, you know, it's just very easy to sink into if you have a certain personality type. And I think heterodox thinkers tend to, to internalize. I, I think the only way to do it is to not make heterodoxy itself your identity. Because if you start identifying, wrapping your identity around that concept, then you're just going to disagree with everything that's mainstream, even when it's right. Um, and I think we've, we have started to see, you know, this kind of thing. And then there's also audience capture, which is because the audience that has validated my existence has gone a certain way, I'm going to start espousing only the ideas that that segment of the, of, of the audience um, espouses because I don't want to piss them off. So you combine those two and, and you can get, you know, exactly what you describe. I, I love that word. It's reflexive contrarianism because you're doing it, you're falling into this pattern. You're not even thinking about it. All you know is contrarianism and you've identified so hard with being one that, you know, you might, it's like, it's like when you identify so much with being a hipster, you won't like something just because some the mainstream starts to like it, right? It's kind of like that self spiting is actually very similar um, effects going on there. So, at the end of the day, it's just don't be don't weld your identity around it. That's kind of the only way I know how to not slip into that. But that's a very good question. Yeah, because too many of us have sunk into the cracks year after year after year. And yeah, it's very niche, right? The was it like don't stare into the abyss long enough because you'll like the abyss looks back at you or something, or you'll embody that. We're gonna do one final question, and then afterwards we're gonna end the show. Okay. So Mars, all right, third time's a charm for this guy. With IDW, new atheism movements disbanded. What do you see on the horizon for new intellectual groups in the future? We still need them. What can we do better the next time around? Um, I think articulating what we stand for versus what we stand against is going to be very important. And also, you know, really hammering down on this idea that it's really okay to disagree with somebody and and still have be friends with that person still talk to that person i mean the reason this is broken down is exactly actually what sam harris said he said when the conversation stops that's where war begins because there's no other option yeah. and unfortunately that is exactly what we saw you know just happen to the idw many of its starting members aren't even talking to each other to me that's really the the ultimate you know failure point of of any intellectual movement um, and, and if we kind of keep these two things, we have to articulate what we stand for, not just against, you know, I think, I mean, to some extent, I think it's true that hate can bind more than love, right? I think there should be a dating app where we bond over what we hate, because I think that's a very strong bond. Like I freaking hate parsley or something. And that's a very strong bond. Um, you like to attack but, things. It's fun. Yeah, I like to, exactly. Exactly. But but we cannot be reflexive haters, right? Just like what mm -hmm. Ember said, we can be reflexive, <laughs> just like reflexive contrarians. Um, but I, I don't know what comes next. You know, I, I think the the schism because the 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 what is going to replace the IDW, right? It's it's very interesting what's what's come what seems to be coming up next. It's um, as I mentioned, this rise of neoclassical reactionism. 
people that are, you know, really tied into crypto. Uh, they, they respect vitality and beauty and strength and uh, masculinity. It's very interesting what's, what's going to replace it. Um, but in a way, the neoclassical reactions are actually defining what they love, you know, um, tradition, hearkening back to, like I said, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, mm -hmm. principles of Western civilization. Um, and then there's also the weird tech utopian side that, that are into crypto and everything. That seems to be another branch of former IDW or big overlap with IDW uh, people. Like we can't trust the governments where they're all black pilled anyway. Yeah. So let's try to build a crypto, uh, you know, like a utopian state, a new state based on on these new technologies that subvert the government anyway, because they're useless. So it's it's interesting to see what's going to replace it and where people are going to um, are going to slot in. And then there's actually the rise of just old school religion again. I don't know if you're seeing. I am definitely seeing that. Like even in the younger generation, it's that's represented by I mean, activists yeah. who are. Um, sort of opining for a tradi more traditional roles. You know, I, I feel like we've come so far breaking down gender roles, um, going and in a way pulled way too far that we can't, we don't even know what a man and woman is anymore. It's like, it confuses people. So now there's this pendulum swing back to trad, trad life, trad wife. Oh, I'm just going to be a stay at home mom. And I, I, I don't, you know, there are these pendulum, we're in the middle of the Hegelian, synthesis almost so i i don't know what what's yeah. next but i i, I know that we're not you that i don't is want the, to see exactly. the growth of the other extreme because wokeism causes problems hence why we, exactly. we actually ended up creating atheist or because we don't want to see another extreme rise as a reactionary effect to wokeism exactly exactly and and also the other thing is is showing conservatives that atheists are not all crazy also mm -hmm. like i think that is the other Thing that atheist for liberty does it's it's giving atheism a good face because there's this idea you know that it's just full of blue hair it's like basically indistinguishable from the libs of tiktok twitter feed right. where blue hair screaming you know and and here you have thomas sheedy and his nice suit and like ben shapiro affect and he's like you know an acceptable conservative so this is this is great this is pr and i'm uh, grateful that you're doing the work that you're doing I love how you always link me to Ben Shapiro. I remember every time we go to a social function, you tell everybody all the freaking time, oh, Tommy Shreedy, he's just the best Ben Shapiro impression. And I can only- But I, you I do, but you actually do. Hard. I actually do. I, I, I do appreciate that. That's that's a very nice very nice compliment. I do. I do but for uh, the record, I have been called, if you Google my Twitter handle, I have been called budget Ben Shapiro. That budget Ben Shapiro. Just budget. So, so I, I'm not even Ben Shapiro. At least you're. Oh, we got I'm good budget. Ben Shapiro impressioner, and then we got budget yeah. Ben Shapiro. Budget. Like I'm so yeah. yeah. Such a bad version. Wanna be? You know, I've that's been. I, I was so impressed with the insult I retweeted. I was just like, oh, you got to respect the insult. Yeah. Yeah. Hemant Mehta should write a new article: Meeting of the Minds, Diversity in the Atheist Community. Melissa Chen Tomashidi. I think that would become his number one hit piece. I'd spread it around. I spread it around quite a bit. I'll uh, get every. I'll platform it uh, and and send it out to our email list. We'll okay. see how that goes. But um, I, I want to conclude the show this way. I um, I remember having a conversation with you and others uh, on our board, having a conversation with you about, about wanting to get you more involved with Atheists for Liberty, trying to get you on our advisory board. And I remember just the the eagerness. That you showed in wanting to support us going into your stories to what happened to you in the atheist community you and i talking at that at that castle for hours upon hours on yeah. end as to as to this this frustration that we both shared so what happened with godlessness what happened to this vibrant great community that you and i spent building up our careers on that was and, that was necessary it really yeah. provided a, an, an outlet you know for people who needed to see solace and whatever it is that they were facing from before um their previously religious lives so it's it's tragic that it doesn't exist it is very tragic and it's also not tragic that i'm not going to do a ben shapiro impression on the stream but i appreciate everybody for trying Okay, we're not going to do that today. If you subscribe and if you keep in touch with uh, Atheist for Liberty and what we do and you all continue to tune in, be loyal viewers, maybe one day I will. Maybe one day you will. I, I won't get Thomas to read the lyrics to WAP. How about someday? 
Well, that's that's how we started this conversation because you and I were both watching Ben Shapiro doing WAP. Yeah, uh, that's oh, we're that really. And then and then he actually did the question and it was like scary. It was like it was one and the same. It was like that Freedom Tunes or something. It was so good. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. I, I watch Ben Shapiro compilations when it comes to that stuff sometimes. So I, I maybe I'll be able to do it one day if I am in the right mood. But right now I'm not because I have to conclude the show. Melissa's been on for too long and we have to say our farewell. So okay, I, 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 don't blame on me. Don't blame on me. I, I blame I, I, stay to see who myself. Can I, so. I have to blame on somebody. Um, Jay Gibbs. You can blame on Gibbs. I'll blame it on Gibbs. Gibbs, the coolest dog in the culture war. Um, but I, but I want to thank you so much for coming on the show because just the passion that you showed in supporting us and supporting what we do, it really means a lot, um, Melissa. And I, I, I really do mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, and to all of you watching, please, again, subscribe to Atheist for, for Liberty's YouTube channel, like this video, so, uh, hit the notification bell, become a member. $1 a month, guys, $12 a year. We're a 501c3 organization, and your donation is tax deductible. We do try to fulfill our membership benefits as much as possible. We have a lot of great programs that we're working on right now. We have four different volunteer committees working in function to continue what we're doing. Not only do we seek to defend enlightenment values, but we want to platform the greatest minds of the 21st century. People like Melissa, being one of them so thank you everybody for tuning in um have a merry christmas have a happy merry holidays christmas. have a happy new year we will be on seven days from now december 30 2021 with dr ronald a Lindsay, former executive director of the center for inquiry we're going to have a very interesting discussion executive to executive old man to young man i think it's going to be a very decent chat from there so melissa chen thank you so much for coming on the stream thank you Th there. thomas and happy Festivus for the rest of us. Happy, happy Festivus for the rest of us, right? Good, good way to bring yeah. us back. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll all talk soon.